Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us again today uh, for another live retail roundtable. We're calling this one A Bridge to Spring 2021. It's hard to believe we're two weeks out from the end of 2020. I pretty much agree. Everybody on this call, panelists, attendees included, could not hope for that to come any sooner. But before we get to all of the content that we have ready for you today, I did want to go over a couple of ground rules with our webinars, mainly with audio. We want to make sure that you can hear us as well as you possibly can. And that goes with the GoToPanel webinar. You have the choice of computer or phone audio, so please use whichever works best for you. Secondly, questions. This is a live panel, and we're going to save some time at the end for Q&A. So please use the questions panel within GoToWebinar and submit your questions throughout the presentation. If we don't get to them during the live session, we can certainly follow up with you afterwards. Uh, the most important question that we get is recording. Will a recording be made available? And absolutely, yes. We will be making a recording available to you so that you can view this on your own or with your team. If you do need to drop off before the end, please feel free to do so. We are gonna send a recording out for you. So who is Management One? For those of you who aren't familiar with us, thank you for joining. Um, for about 30 plus years now, Management One has operated with a main purpose of providing financial security for our people, our clients, and our affiliates. And we do that through a focus on merchandise intelligence and education for independent retailers like, like this session here for you. We operate with the core values of a generous heart, courage, curiosity, adaptability, commitment, and collaboration. I think we're addressing pretty much all of those today. And we've also made a special commitment to increase racial and ethnic diversity, not only in our company and our network, uh, but we also wanted to improve racial and social justice this year and in the years to come. So the theme today, we try to find a quote that embodies our theme. And I think Thomas Fuller's quote, the darkest hour of the night comes just before the dawn is probably the most applicable here mainly because of the current wave of COVID. I think whether you call it the second wave or the third wave, it's clearly the worst wave. And it's a little different though. This is not the March and April that we saw first. There's actually hope on the horizon. I think in March and April, when things were starting to get extremely ugly, there was that uncertainty. We didn't know where the bottom was. How long is this gonna go? We heard two weeks, two months, some people were saying, two to three years before we get back to a sense of normal. And now we actually have something to be hopeful for. We don't have an exact date, but there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And it starts most obviously with the vaccine that just started being distributed across the globe. And this has a twofold effect. Number one, obviously physically, we can start tackling this disease head on, but it's also a mental, hope that people are getting that they can actually get out again. They can get back into the store. There's something that they can have to get them up and out of the store or out of their home into the store. So what does that retail landscape look like now? For you, a little bit different than March and April. Now with some of the available spaces, landlords are giving a little more leeway. There's some reduced and leveraged rent opportunities. Uh, there's definitely less stores on the market. I believe in April or May, Retail Dive put out an article and they said, probably underestimating it a little bit, but they estimated about 30,000 stores would be closing by the end of the year, which obviously unfortunate, but it does offer, offer an opportunity to gain market share for your business, whether it's on the national or the local channel. I think the most important thing, it goes back to the vaccine is People are just looking to get out. It's easy to click a button and buy products, of course, but people are looking for that immersive experience and they're looking to get out, get in store, talk to people. They're tired of being at home. And that's an opportunity for you to really build your brand experience with current and future customers. One of the good things that we've seen as well is the built-up demand in 
the amount of money that people are going to have to spend. I mean, people aren't going on vacation. They're not going to the theater. They're not going to concerts. In many cases, people have this pent up demand in their consumer spending. Where are they going to spend that money? If you market it correctly, if you stay on top of your channels, they're hopefully going to spend it with you. And finally, hopefully, the government is talking about possibly round two with a relief package. Uh, the recent news cycles have it in the range of about 900 billion with possibly about a third of that going to the SBA. And with the government, obviously, there isn't a hard date for this yet, but again, it provides that little bit of hope on the horizon that wasn't quite there in March and April. So what does this all mean? In 2021, January 1st, are things just gonna go right back to normal? No. We have a, a pretty tough winter ahead of us. We're speaking with some of our clients that are just fatigued and they're tired of fighting this fight and they just don't know what they can do. Maybe I, they should just shut down their stores for the winter and, and wait for spring. And we wanted to put this webinar together and organize the panel that we did to really show what you can do in the next 10 to 12 weeks to lay a solid foundation for success within your store. And the first person I'll bring on I wanted to address is Paul Erickson, Director of Sales here at Management One. Take it away, Paul. Thanks, Nico. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the webinar. You know, it was about 16 years ago that Barry Schwartz's book, The Paradox of Choice, was published. And even though it was not a book about retail, it had a lot of ramifications for retailers. Schwartz argued that reducing consumer choices actually reduces anxiety for shoppers. And other words, uh, if you give your customer too many things to pick from, human beings simply will not be able to choose. And there have been a tremendous amount of studies on this over the last 16 years since the book came out. Uh, most recently, a, I think a, a, a wonderful study by Princeton uh, that I think proved without question that what Barry Schwartz was advocating was actually fact. I could actually, I can tell you from a personal perspective that is true because when my two youngest daughters were little, I used to take them to a Baskin and Robbins. This is how old I am, by the way. I used to take them to a Baskin and Robbins uh, ice cream parlor with 80 flavors, and it was like absolute torture to get them to choose. Uh, it would take me hours, literally, to get them to choose and get them out of there. And finally, one day, I asked my older daughter, I go, why is this always taking so long when we come and try to pick ice cream? And I think out of uh, the mouth of babes comes great wisdom. And she said, you know, Dad, it's really about uh, being afraid to make the wrong choice when there's so many choices. Nico, you can go to the next slide. You know, the one thing we've learned at Management One is that the pandemic has proven the importance of less is more. Uh, I can tell you that over the last nine months, we have witnessed client after client after client that is doing the same business they were pre-pandemic or more with a fraction of the inventory the investment that they were accustomed to carrying. And by the way, this is true of small stores, independent retailers, and chains. In fact, the CEO of Bed Bath & Beyond, Mark Triton, was quoted recently in the New York Times saying that the wider the assortment, the more confused the customer is. Customers want something that is digestible. They want retailers to edit down their choices. So think about that when you write orders for spring, summer. Think about how you can start trimming styles, trimming colors, because you need to eliminate decision paralysis that grips your customers when they're faced with way too many options. And the benefits are going to be many fold. It'll, it'll start that you'll trim end of season markdowns, but even more importantly, it's actually going to boost profitable sales because the customer wants new. So we're urging everyone, our clients and non-clients, 2021, speed up your plan turns. Hold less inventory, but make sure the new products are arriving every week because your growth in 2021 is going to be dependent on a good, even flow of new product into your store. And number two, please do not ignore mistakes. You know, mistakes are part of life, and I think you can't really grow as a person or as a retailer if you don't make mistakes. But recognizing them, recognizing the problem is important. 
So forget about margin at that point and think cash flow. Take a markdown that's going to get the merchandise off the sales floor quickly to make room for the next round of receiving that hopefully will sell better. It's not a zero-sum game. Everything in 2021 is going to be moving, getting inventory in and out of your store quickly, not just at full price, but also sale price. Now, I like to talk about Costco because Costco is a great example of a store that's done a superb job of editing assortments. And let me give you an example of how edited Costco's assortments are. The average Costco store carries about 8,000 SKUs. Now, I want you to compare that with grocery stores or even their number one competitor, Sam's Club, which actually carry over 100,000 SKUs. Costco is, is known for editing assortments. And if you want ketchup and you're going to Costco, you better want that size, you better want that brand, Heinz, and you better want to pay a, buy a lot of it. But what is interesting about Costco that we can all learn from is that they've always worked on a hyper fast inventory rotation. You know that Costco doesn't even own the merchandise that's in their stores? It's not on consignment. They don't own the inventory because their merchandise is sold so quickly that it is gone before the invoice even comes due. And while Costco works with some of the lowest IMUs uh, in their vertical, the max is 15%. The secret sauce of Costco is that every time you enter a Costco store, it is a voyage of discovery. There's always something new to entice their shoppers. I came in for ketchup and I walked out with a flat screen TV. Who knew? <laughs> so let's start talking about and preparing for a successful spring summer in 2021. Nico kind of alluded to this, but analysts have projected GDP to accelerate in the United States anywhere from four to six and a half percent. Moody's came out last week with their estimate of a six and a half percent increase in GDP in 2021 in the United States. And as Nico said, personal savings it is an all time high, doubling from pre pandemic days. Now, let me go one further on what Nico said. That translates into one point five trillion dollars in cash that's been sitting on the sidelines for 11 months. But before all this wonderful things happen, the pace of recovery is going to get worse before it gets better. And the virus resurgence is probably going to put the brakes on the recovery for much of Q1 next year. So how do we deal with these two divergent issues, a difficult Q1, but a possible a rapid recovery starting in Q2? Well, number one, plan conservatively for January and February. Those two months are definitely gonna be challenging. The holidays are gonna be over. People are gonna be staying home as the pandemic still rages out of control. So make sure your website is ready to do business to help clear fall winter. Be aggressive on getting out of seasonal product. But with that said, do not walk away from those departments and categories where we can still do business. You know, we believe there will be a rapid recovery, a rapid re uh, rebound for our clients, starting maybe the second half of March, but certainly into Q2 in April. And we think sales are going to return to 2019 levels or even better. No one really knows. This is an unprecedented time with unprecedented amount of capital that people will be spending uh, into late spring, into summer. But here is the difference. Inventories have to meet sales growth and still need to be planned at a much quicker turn with narrow and deep, the preferred approach in terms of assortments. One other thing Nico said was we, we're, we're probably gonna lose 30,000 doors in 2020. And who are those people? The retail world is gonna look dramatically different. Steinmart, Lord & Taylor, Asina, Sir Latab, Brooks Brothers, Lucky, J.C. Penney, Stage Stores, Aldo, Neiman Marcus, J. Crew, True Religion, Bodell Sporting Goods, Pier One, and I've just scratched the surface of those retailers that have either downsized through Chapter 11 reorganization or have completely shuttered through a Chapter 7. There will be 30,000 less locations next year. Rents are coming down through basic supply demand forces. And there's going to be a lot less chain inter supply chain interruptions as actually COVID has been pretty much cleaned up in Asia, most importantly, China and Vietnam. 
So the opportunity, everybody, is there. But we have to be financially smarter. And we have to be strategically more nimble going forward. Now I'd like to turn it over to my protege and former professional super slalom skier, D Dane Cohen, to take it away from here. Go ahead, Dane. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And honestly, that was some great information. So, you know, next up, we're going to speak with uh, someone who I've looked up to in the industry for a while now, uh, Brian Trunzo. And we're going to speak about uh, spring 2021 trends. So, Brian, I'm going to be your hype man here for a second and just introduce you uh, to the webinar. Brian is currently the head of brands for Informa Markets Fashion Division that oversees Project Magic and the Coterie Shows. Uh, Brian was formerly a senior trend forecaster at WGSN, and Brian's a former retailer himself. So he co-founded and co-operated Carson Street Clothiers, uh, which was an amazing boutique in downtown Manhattan, and he also co-founded the brand Duvo. So Brian has a ton of experience when it comes to consumer insights and trends. So Brian, let's jump in. Um, what are you seeing as some of the big trends for spring 2021? Yeah, I, I don't even know where to start because there's so much to um, really talk about here. So thankfully, we were able to put some of these slides together in advance. Um, so I'll start here with the GORP Core, the continuation of that or the evolution of that. Uh, and for those of us on the call who have uh, never heard the term GORP or GORP Core, uh, GORP is just an all-encompassing uh, catch-all to describe any sort of uh, crunchy granola Pacific Northwest behavior. So from uh, hiking to uh, climbing to any sort of activity uh, that celebrates the great outdoors. Uh, and, and I think that this trend, which really started, uh, let's say, in 2018, uh, has just only been um, supersized through the pandemic, <clears throat> excuse me, from young streetwear labels uh, who are finding interest in the aesthetic generally uh, to legacy brands like Ralph Lauren, who are really leaning into uh, some of their older, uh, uh, more um, recognized lines from uh, an age of nostalgia, let's say the 90s, like their high tech line, uh, which also la launched in 2018. But, you know, as we've been staying at home with stay at home orders, uh, as there's been uh, travel restrictions, uh, it's, it's caused Americans especially to really appreciate the great outdoors as it's really the only thing that we can do these days uh, in any sort of social way, either alone or with others. Um, so I just think that's going to continue uh, and pick up steam. And, and I think some really interesting trends will, will spin out of that. I think there's inspiration to be found in other sorts of mindful and wellness driven activities that, that lean on this concept of GORP. Um, so anything from gardening uh, to pottery, to knitting, uh, to any sort of sedentary activity that, that can take place outdoors. All right, that's great. I'll make sure to get some knitting gear for the upcoming season. So, you know, obviously you can see we're all, a lot, a lot of us are still working from home. So retailers saw, saw sweatpants and loungewear be a huge trend uh, over these last few months of the pandemic. What's it going to be move, moving forward? You know, I like to call it the 2020 mullet, professional on top, pajamas on bottom. So uh, what, what are we going to see moving forward? I think we're going to see uh, a move towards smarter, uh, more polished dressing. Again, I think that return is inevitable. Um, personally, myself and those who I socialize with, I've had conversations about becoming bored with sweatpants and becoming bored with the 2020 business professional mullet, as you say, Dane. Um, and and I, I, don't, I don't see uh, a full stop return to, uh, you know, business professional attire coming in spring. I think it'll take a little bit longer, but I think, you know, finding ways to be uh, a little bit more versatile with your wardrobe and moving beyond sweatpants is again, simply inevitable. So everything from, uh, you know, more interesting fits with denim as a bridge to tailoring where you can dress up or down denim, things like that, um, to some of the more um, innovative brands on the emerging side of the aisle playing around with tailoring in a more youthfully and culturally relevant way. Uh, we've seen some of these blazing upstart streetwear brands really lean into the tailoring look. Uh, and I think that's because for the last four or so years um, in, in the youth scene, there's there's been such an explosion in graphics and, and very sort of out there um, garish looks that 
all of a sudden that doesn't feel all that subversive anymore to a youth buyer, right? So uh, there has been this ironic shift in the pendulum to tailoring being a little bit more subversive, ironically, where uh, you can look at things like prep in a new way uh, and, and sort of uh, lean into a youthful interpretation of prep. And there are some really great brands doing it in the space right now. Um, great inspiration from Rowing Blazers. Uh, Amé Leon Dor is another brand that's really leaning into that new prep uh, look. Uh, heritage brand Drake's uh, from London. Uh, they're doing a, a youthful interpretation of uh, prep that leans on some of the more uh, culturally relevant and younger aesthetics that come from streetwear. Um, so definitely a return to polished dressing is, is on its way. And what about that more, you know, that traditional suiting and, you know, for women's uh, boutiques, that evening wear, is it going to be some time before we see that really reemerge? I think so. I, I, I really do. Uh, and that's going to come down to each regional market, you know, uh, in, in some of the um, southern states that are a little bit uh, easier with restrictions. Uh, I think that there is more of an appetite and desire for occasional wear and for evening dressing. Um, but in uh, in the East and on the West, I, I don't see that happening necessarily for spring. Right. So, you know, Nico spoke a little bit about uh, at the beginning of this call, there's, there's definitely a wave of optimism that should be coming soon. Um, you know, with the vaccine in the works and, and people now starting to be administered. What can we see in terms of, you know, I'm going to let you, you kind of take this one because th there's a lot of energy and fun and brightness on this page. So what, what can we expect here? Yeah, so some of the imagery on this page are from uh, what I see as some of the more interesting younger brands that are playing in this more optimistic lane. Uh, if anyone's looking for some inspiration out there, two that come to mind that play on both the men's and women's uh, side of the aisle in an emerging uh, in an emerging way is Jacquemus and Casablanca, both from Paris. Um, and some of the imagery on this page are from those brands. But in, in thinking about optimism, and on this page you can see here it says American exceptionalism and, and the word hopeful. Um, I, I think that ever since 2017, there was this narrative that was playing through the 24-7 news cycle of just doom and gloom. Um, and when you couple that with pop culture um, that looks at uh, politics through a certain lens, the interpretation and the trickle down from some of the designer houses was this idea of a dystopian American future, right? Calvin Klein was definitely a part of that vision when they had Ralph, uh, uh, sorry, Ralph Simmons as their creative director, a lot of the imagery that they were putting forth was this American nightmare sort of aesthetic, um, which was really turbocharged by that 24-7 news cycle. Uh, you know, fast forward a couple of years and, you know, obviously going through the pandemic, doom and gloom was still sort of the vibe that we felt from a cultural perspective. But I feel like as we move away from that 24-7 news cycle that's focusing on doom and gloom, uh, and as we move towards uh, a vaccine, I do think that optimism uh, and American exceptionalism is a trend that can be implemented in ranges uh, from color uh, straight through to general aesthetic. All right. So, you know, a, a lot of retailers have seen the, the spending power of millennials. Now the next generation up is Gen Z. What are we seeing when it comes to that Gen Z generation coming up? Gen Z is a very interesting uh, generation. Um, at at some times they can play into a dystopian future. At other times they can play into optimism. They're a very individualistic generation. Um, but what's most interesting to me about this generation is that they grew up with technology in a way that even millennials have not. Um, and as you can see on this page here, the idea of video games and VR really pushing a digital, which is a blend of physical and digital, uh, a digital future is something that we should all be aware of. Um, and while gaming can be sort of a, a new frontier for many people or even um, so, so a foreign concept that people do not know where to begin in terms of analyzing it to find trends, uh, I would encourage anyone to start on Google and try to find the breadcrumbs to see what's happening in the space um, because uh, we're seeing a lot of innovation come from collaborations between fashion and video games. Um, everyone from Nike, Adidas, and Vans uh, have been collaborating with video games straight through to um, rappers that have a lot of cachet with Gen Z. So uh, Travis Scott comes to mind, a uh, famous rapper from Houston who did a concert with uh, the, the video game Fortnite. Uh, they released product around that and, and just so many trends are bubbling around the world of video games. I think, you know, uh, you're at your peril to ignore it. Um, and last, I will say, you know, to, to plug Polo again, Ralph Lauren again, 
uh, even they have played in the space of video games, VR, AR, um, by teaming up with Snapchat uh, on a Memoji launch by, uh, by releasing limited uh, Memojis on the Snapchat platform. So definitely a place to pay attention to. All right, and, and if any of those terms were foreign to anybody on the call, they're a little foreign to me as well, so thank you for that. And, you know, just in terms of, so we heard about these great trends and, and what's to come, where should retailers be looking to shop? You know, we, we had some markets that were closed uh, over the past year. Moving forward, how are retailers going to be shopping? Just from a, an Informa uh, perspective, you know, we're looking into regional markets. So for many people on the call, I'm sure you're aware that we will be having our pop-up uh, as we call it, and only Informa could have a 100,000 square foot event that's called a pop-up, uh, a very safe pop-up uh, in Orlando, February 9th to the 11th. So uh, we're trying to be where our consumers are. Uh, and through research, we found that um, taking safety into consideration, of course, that Orlando would be a, a place for a regional market. Um, but also just thinking about 365 day a year communities, right? Uh, more so than ever, uh, retailers are dealing with brands um, outside of traditional marketplaces. They're reaching out to each other um, digitally. Uh, and that's a place where Informa is growing. You know, we, we are looking to launch 365 day a year communities. Uh, we're developing into an always on content strategy to make sure that we're providing information around our shows and other products that we will be launching. Um, so definitely digitally uh, with our digital trade event and then uh, regionally with new markets. So that's where you should be. All right, awesome. Well, Brian, that was some great insight into trends. I know that I'm excited about spring 2021 and hopefully I will see you in Orlando, right? If you're there, I'm there, so. All right, thanks, Brian. Uh, Nick, I'm gonna throw it back to you. Thank you both. Um, I will say too that Brian was very generous with providing us the notes. If you thought that some of those brand names being thrown out came at you very quickly, uh, they certainly did for me too. We're putting together a blog post with uh, everything that Brian and Dane were talking about so that we have a, a frame of reference to really put out to you. And Brian, what I like what you guys did at Informa here is you're fusing that in-person and digital throughout 2021 before you get that, that 365 day. I'm not personally going to be in Orlando, unfortunately, but I am very much circling August 9th with the Magic Las Vegas. I know Management One, we've been at Magic for several years now in February and August, and it was something that we definitely missed in 2020 uh, in August. So we're, we're looking forward to getting back to that. So we've thrown a lot out at you guys as far as inventory, product trends. None of those things are really going to work if you're not staying connected to your customers. You can stock whatever you like in your store. If people are not going to be connected with your brand, it's just going to sit there. So I wanted to invite Stacy Pecor, uh, the owner of Olive and Betty's, because she actually took the extra step when we're talking about staying connected to your customers. How do you do that when you're in a store in Manhattan that's basically been shut down thanks to the COVID nightmare. How are you going to pivot your business? For a lot of folks, it is digital channels. We've been talking about this since March. And what I like about Stacy's story, before I turn it over to you, Stacy, is the fact that you just went full on at it and you had the courage to take your business forward and just embrace digital. Uh, I wanted you to share a little bit about your experience with the business during COVID? Well, we, on a Monday, we called in our staff and we said, you know, we're confident that we're gonna be able to stay open with a limited um, staff in New York City. And by Friday, the governor had told us we had to close because we were a non-essential business. And here I was with four stores in Manhattan my warehouse and my offices and all of a sudden we couldn't go into work anymore so i had a minute where i sort of you know sat there and felt bad for myself and a friend of mine said you know what you're smart and you're strong you're going to figure this out so i called janie my manager from madison avenue and i said we're gonna take the van, we're gonna load it with all the merchandise in the Soho store, and we're gonna drive it to my cottage, because at that point I was living in a cottage, I had just sold my house, 
and we are going to figure out how to sell this merchandise. So that was on a Saturday. And on Monday, we went live on Facebook and Instagram and set up virtual appointments to start selling the merchandise. And describe the virtual appointments really quickly. So a virtual appointment, when we go live on Instagram or Facebook, we are highlighting merchandise that we believe in. We're putting it together as if you were having an appointment with us in the store. And after we go live, our phones start ringing and we set up an appointment to go through the product um, via FaceTime. And we try to talk to the client before to find out what their lifestyle is, what their sizes are, what they're looking for, because at this time, obviously, we have a limited inventory. So we want to put it together in a way that's authentic, not only for Olive and Betty's, but for the client. And is this more of a one-to-one -one experience or is it small groups? It can be, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. It can be Janie and I, one with a client. It could be a client with her kids. You know, um, everyone's pretty much socially distanced, so it's not sort of a shopping party, for example. And what we've found is, you know, we had to close off four of our locations, and that really is what um, I focused, you know, the first couple of months of the pandemic on. I had four, five different landlords. So closing those locations and getting out of those leases was my most important focus. But what we found was that our clients still wanted to shop with us and that they really wanted to hear my voice and how I put the product together. And so they had an opportunity to do that, almost like one-on-one -on -one shopping with me every single day. So I would go live and then Janie, who was my manager from Madison Avenue, would set up the appointments and do the virtual appointments with them while I was trying to close our business, basically. And it gives the consumer hyper access directly to the owner of the business, which is something they probably didn't get in the four or five locations. Only if they shopped with me on a Saturday, absolutely. <laughs> So before I get to the actual social selling part of it, I think people are probably asking themselves in the audience right now, so what, are you saying I should close my store and just go online? No, that's not what we're saying here. It's it's a very extreme case. It's something that Stacy took the courage to do for her own business. Obviously, Manhattan rents are through the roof, and this is what this is the action that she chose to take for her business there is absolutely going to be an audience for the in-store market and if you have the ability to maintain both channels i think what we're saying here is you have to do it in tandem with a digital strategy there's going to be an audience that maybe still isn't comfortable leaving the store there's going to be another audience that is hyper comfortable getting out and they want that in-store experience so how are you going to fuse your digital strategy with your in-store strategy. And we've touched on omni-channel in some of our previous sessions, uh, so I won't go too deeply into that here. What we can say is an e-commerce website, whether or not you focus entirely on that and entirely on digital, it's not gonna be an option in 2021. A lot of our clients were quick to embrace e back in April and May. Some were a little bit slower, and we did have a small subset that still didn't quite believe that it was going to be necessary. I think in 2021 and subsequent years ahead, e -com is just no longer an option. Um, what worked best for Stacy is social selling. And Stacy, I think you already alluded to why. It was really just that, that authentic connection that you made with customers. And I wanted you to touch a little bit on, on your method for how you deliver some of these. Yes, and when we opened in Greenwich, Connecticut in August. So like you said, we have an omni-channel. We have our e-commerce website. You can shop with us on Facebook. You can shop with us on Instagram, or you can set up a virtual appointment. And what we have found is as people are more, more scared, that's not really a word, um, to come into the store, what the store has become really is our ability 
to gather new clients. So as they come in, they shop with us, they become a new client. And it has become so transactional in the store where they come in and buy one of this or one of that. We find that the digital appointments, our average sale is well over $800. So what we really want to do is set up a virtual appointment. That is, you know, we can gather everything together. We can put a look together for you. We can customize it exactly for what you're looking for. So that is really our goal right now is to continue to book these digital appointments to go live on Instagram and Facebook and grow our business that way. A lot of folks are probably thinking in the audience, well, she was totally set up for this, you know, to go digital. It's good for her to be in that position, but you had never done this before, right? I had never done it before. And we were, we are still filming it on our iPhones. And so we have one person filming on Facebook, one person filming on Instagram, or I had in the very beginning, Janie holding two phones in my, literally in my cottage. You know, I had my son walking through or my daughter walking through. We had the product in my daughter's bedroom upstairs. We had it in the basement. You know, we were doing everything we could to keep the business alive. And I had never gone live on Instagram or Facebook. And when the internet was bad, you know, it lagged, it still does. And that's what makes it authentic. And the other thing that we learned was that, especially when we couldn't get fresh new product, because at Olive and Betty's, our whole business model was new product every single day, was that we could take out product that wasn't as fresh and make it fresh and not in a way that wasn't true to the client. I'm doing our live today and I'm using a dress that we received in March. So it's not new. And when I go live with it, I always say you might have this dress in your wardrobe. If you don't, you need it in your wardrobe. So we're always telling the truth to them. And we're using some merchandise that we've had for several seasons now, but it doesn't make the merchandise not, you know, it, it's still valid and it might even be more valid right now than it was when we bought it. Absolutely. And I like how you keyed in on the authenticity of it. It's not about a high tech video production. It's just about speaking the truth about your brand and about your products. And I think that's what, what really keyed in with folks. Uh, without sharing obviously hard data numbers so what was the overall impact what was the end result of closing the stores going online was it beneficial for the business or are you still trying to get back to the, a baseline um you know we're making more money than we were with four stores but it's like a fraction of what we are doing it's just we don't have the cost associated with new york city whether it's payroll, rent, obviously, even your real estate taxes are so unbelievable, you know, keep you up at night. And so there's, we didn't have the option of not closing the stores. We, we it, there just wasn't an option. If we can't do business, we can't afford those rents. It doesn't matter how long you've saved and how successful you've been. It's your rents are just so astronomical. So we closed, we had to sell the merchandise and we did everything we could to sell it in a way that didn't dilute our brand. We always had to stay true to our brand. And I moved three times during that period. Um, and we sat at my kitchen table, Janie and I, and we said, we have to go where she is. And so we said, you know, we were always New York City's neighborhood store. I always had opportunities to open outside the city. And I always said, I am not going to open outside the city. My client is here. This is who we are. This is who we are as a brand. And after COVID sitting in my kitchen, we were like, okay, where she is, is in Connecticut. You know, she's in Greenwich, Connecticut. So, you know, I called a broker. I had never been up here. I had never, you know, 
I, I didn't even know what Greenwich was really. And I went to dinner and I was like, I don't know if I can do this. And my boyfriend's like, your client's here, you gotta do it. So I moved myself, I opened my business and we opened a pop-up here. We've been here since August and we're getting ready to sign um, a three-year lease down the block. So. That's awesome. I think the overarching thing that really comes through with your story is just courage. There's some folks that are just, when they were faced with that adversity, they're just thinking, I need to close this down. I need to just move on with my life and find something else. And when we bring Ron on in a little bit, retailers don't have that mentality. When things get tough, you find a way to make it work. And what I love about your story is that you found a way to make it work and you had the courage to just dive into it head first. And I think if our audience takes anything away from your story, it's absolutely that. Uh, again, before I bring, no, go ahead. You don't feel courageous while you're doing it. I think you're just running <laughs> on adrenaline because I've never done anything else. So I didn't have a choice. But you stuck to it and it's worked out. Which is so great. Far, so good. Let's knock on something. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about one more digital channel as well. Um, I know this is not applying to Olive and Betty's as much, but it does for many of our retailers, and that's email marketing. Uh, in the next couple of months, even if you're not seeing a lot of in store traffic, that email marketing channel is going to be extremely important to you. Uh, similar to what we were talking about with social selling, this doesn't have to be a very high tech structure that you're implementing. You don't have to have a lot of automation and dynamic product placements in your emails. It's just about staying connected to your customers. So even if it's just a one-on-one -on -one email that you send out with your targeted VIP list, take the time in these next couple of months to really sit down with your email list and see, am I sending the right message? Is this getting my brand the most visibility? And am I delivering connectivity with my customers? We talk so much about digital channels, especially in the last nine months. We don't want people to forget the 20th century tech that's out there. A lot of snail mail, the direct mail, that's seen a huge resurgence in the last nine months. I'm getting catalogs from brands that I've never seen a catalog from before, and they know that people are stuck at home and they're leveraging that channel. So if you have it within you, even just to send a six by nine postcard to current customers, make sure that you can let them know about an upcoming event, let them know about a new product, maybe you're setting up a pop-up somewhere. If you do send it, try to find a way to tie that direct mail piece back to your digital channels. QR codes are probably one of the best ways. Uh, ever since smartphones integrated the QR directly into the camera, they, uh, that technology has seen a huge resurgence. Uh, we mentioned personalized phone calls. This is not cold calling, this is not setting up a phone bank in your store. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, again, that personal touch. You're very high value customers. Getting them on the phone and just letting them know what's going on with new product on the horizon, new events, any way that you can reach out to them personally. Uh, the main thing too, product packaging. Everybody is shipping products now or they're delivering them curbside there isn't that in-store experience where they can actually talk to a salesperson. So how you present your brand in that particular package, that is your connection with the customer. That takes the place of that in-store experience. So what are you offering them when they're opening the box? Is it a thank you? Is there a personalized note? Is there something that alludes to other products that you may have on the horizon? Don't pass up that opportunity to reach out to your customer in the packaging. And we mentioned it a little bit before, uh, unique events. If you have the ability, if your store is closed, can you set up a tent sale? Can you set up a, a pop-up store in somebody else's location? Is there a collaboration that you can come up with with somebody in your community? Don't take any of these ideas off of the table. If we take away anything from this, in the next 10 to 12 weeks, it's about options. You have options available if your store is closed and you have consumers that are out there that want to hear from your brand. With all of these things that we're telling you to do, it's 
sometimes a little bit mind boggling. You might think, God, what have I gotten myself into? I've been doing this, spinning my wheels for nine, 10 months. I'm just tired. I don't know why I ever got into retail. <laughs> and I'm so glad that Dane introduced us to Ron Thurston. So I wanted to invite Ron on. Ron's the uh, vice president of stores at Intermix. He's a member of the board of directors at Goodwill. And he also wrote an excellent book called Retail Pride. And I'm not going to take any of the content away from you, Ron. I think you deliver it best. And I want you to talk about the message behind Retail Pride. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nico. And thanks for the invitation. I think the first question people might be asking is, you know, Paul referenced 30,000 stores closing, and I write a book called Retail Pride you know, about this idea of how much people love working in stores. Uh, and I will tell you my kind of planned launch date all along was October, 2020, well before COVID. And the idea of for decades, people have absolutely loved working in stores. People are obsessed with kind of that retail, um, the retail drive, the retail passion. Um, if you can go back, Dane, too, I just want to reference something for a moment. Um, so for those of you that don't know, Intermix, it's, it is the largest multi-brand women's luxury store um, in the country. There's about, we have 32 locations um, and it's owned by The Gap, which is an interesting um, kind of partnership that we have um, with The Gap family of brands. Um, and I'm just gonna plug Goodwill for a moment because Please. Um, you know Goodwill at its core is a retail business um, that, that is generated exclusively by donations from the general public. And the work then that happens is about removing obstacles and barriers to employment. Um, and so even here in New York and New Jersey, there are about 60 different um, kind of um, programs that are in place for goodwill around um, job placement, temp agencies, community centers, um, learning second language skills, um, interview skills, all of that is part of Goodwill. Uh, and so I would just encourage you from all over the country to um, donate to your local Goodwill store. There's a big kind of donation fundraiser event happening in January. Um, and we will certainly take your your donations and your, um, whether it's clothing, home or, or money to Goodwill. It's for a great cause. I so I'm gonna walk you through, so go, go ahead. So I'm gonna just walk you today um, through a fun excerpt from the book, which um, I like to call the top 10 reasons we love working in retail. And this is, again, entirely my own opinion. There's no facts behind any of this, but the fun part is, as I have shared the story, um, that people really do in connect or engage with certain parts of it. All 10 of them may apply to you, but there are certainly at least 10 reasons why people love working in retail. Um, and I would say there's really been never, there's never been a more important reason to work in our business. And I say that intentionally because we are on the verge of really recreating what this industry is, the importance of it, the relevance of it, the idea that, I mean, we're, we're kind of creating the future in stores today through omni growth, through technology, through new experiences, through everything that we do, we're recreating it. So this idea of loving working in stores is about creating the future. Um, and there's really never been a more important time than right now. So, and where I like to start is the fact that it's sometimes forgotten by people that work in stores, how enormous the industry is and that it does often employ your first job. It does one in four people in this country work in retail in some aspect or another. It doesn't mean you work directly in stores, but you maybe you're in offices, you're in support networks, you're in technology, you're in buying, there's real estate, there's so many different departments, but you know, one in four people have worked in this industry or do work in this industry, and one in three people have their first job working in retail. And so I, I like to say, you know, as leaders, it's really our responsibility to always create this incredible experience, which is where retail pride really starts, is that if this is their first job, that we are creating that experience and that foundation for future work. 
and why not make your first job you know one of your favorite jobs so we'll let's start with number one which is you know something we all love is that we create joy our in, our entire intent often in, in brick and mortar retail is to create joy so when, when you're on Amazon website or you're ordering things and we've all had this these frustrating moments of the last several months of ordering and it's really not a joyous experience you are ordering for a purpose or intent um, but then you go to the store and you see you go to you know Olive and Betty's and you're you have this message of joy and hope and engagement that only happens in a brick and mortar store and it will it cannot be replaced in any other function in my own business we do um, chat functions from the website to to store associates and that, that there's a level of joy that I think comes from having your questions answered or being able to engage but it will never be replaced um, without that brick and mortar store experience so for me reason number one is always about creating joy um, reason number two and this has been important this year is we don't give up when it gets hard and it got hard this year Stacy you know, didn't give up when it got hard. And for many of you, you know, I, I talk about you know, that it's hard when business is difficult. It's hard when you don't have traffic or all the different buying challenges, but to not forget how strong you are, why you're in this business, how much you love what you do. So for all of those stores that have closed, what I have seen is, it doesn't mean that there's a career change. It means those people need to find their next great opportunity, their next great company, and that you don't forget how much you love what you do um, and how hard you've worked to succeed in your accidental career. So the subtitle of the book is The Guide to Celebrating Your Accidental Career because retail often is that. And this, you've worked really hard to get there. Now let's find you a great company to work for um, and to not give up from 2020 or or beyond number three we share our knowledge generously i say this again because of the often situations that are faced in the fact that this is accidental and this is self-taught which is another one of the reasons but re there's no particular college degree no foundation no one company that you work for that says i'm going to be successful in retail I personally studied fashion design, which I think helps me in, in some ways running a fashion business. But the idea of sharing your knowledge generously is because that's how we grow and that's how we learn and that's how we engage with, with each other and that's how we make each other better. Uh, and it's a, it's a very, I think, um, often unique aspect of our business because we want to teach each other. We want each other to be better um, and we, we really do. To want we want to bring everyone along i think on our journey which is which is part of this and this is actually one that i keyed on with management one we made a hard pivot to do webinars like this when COVID hit for that specific reason we knew that our clients and just the retail community in general was struggling with what to do in this and we decided that a, a webinar series like this just to deliver knowledge of any kind whatever we could provide is our best course of action and it really helped us get through the pandemic yeah that's that's great uh, number four visual merchandising matters more than ever so when you think about creating joy you think about the in-store experience you think about likely less inventory you think about fewer square foot square a smaller square foot footprint in that visual merchandising is the key to unlocking that joy and well merchandised easy to shop safe clean environments are about great visual merchandising and it has never mattered more than ever and to use kind of your uniqueness and personality and for brands you know there's a, an ongoing conversation about personalization localization um, even for myself, you know, I have stores in New York, LA, Miami, Aspen, all over the country, and each one of them has its own unique visual merchandising personality. We put in the windows what is what's right for in Bell Harbor in Miami that is very different than what happens in Soho, New York, and what she looks for. So every store has different windows, 
every store is merchandised differently and use that uniqueness and personality of your customer and your city um, to embrace this idea that it, this has really never mattered more than ever because you can't get this on a website. This, this level of personalization doesn't exist uh, online. All right, number five is we're all part of a vast retail family. You know, this is one of my favorites because when you do think about it being accidental, you think about your career um, being self-taught, you think about the, the teams of people that you have worked with, we are a vast retail family and that we teach each other, we learn, you know, we run multi-million dollar businesses that is also sometimes forgotten is that you are, you are an executive, regardless of your role, running a multi-million dollar business. And that that being that part of that vast retail family is a huge part of how you grow your career. You know, there's again, if you don't have a one particular college degree that says, I've earned this, therefore I should have this kind of career, it doesn't exist. So you actually have to use this idea of networking and connecting and and reaching out and using all of your resources like LinkedIn to build this family. And it's really um, kind of your chosen family in many ways. Um, number six, every day is different. This could not be more true um, than, you know, and it's honestly what gets me super excited because every day you don't know who's gonna walk through the door. You don't know what's gonna happen in your business. You know, it snowed a foot here in New York. Every day is different. You know, tomorrow is going to be sunny. There's just, there's a level of, I don't walk into the same office and work with the same people every day. And that, that joy that comes with the fact that every day is different is part of the reason that we love it. It can be really frustrating, but it can also be super exciting. Um, and, you know, I'd say on here, you know, bring it on because what we have in common is that we love to win. We love to have a morning meeting, open the door the next day and say, we're going to win no matter what happens. There's two of us here today because other people couldn't get here. We're going to make it happen and it's going to be different tomorrow. And that's, um, it, it's a very, it's a very kind of common trait I've heard from people as I was even writing the book is that they actually love that every day is different in this business. Um, number seven, I've referenced this, but we are mostly self-taught. You learn about how to be a great brick and mortar store, salesperson, stock associate, store manager, visual merchandising manager, whatever that looks like, you really learn it on the job. No one's going to give you a manual and tell you this is how you should do it. And you know, that we, like I said on here, we have the responsibility to shape future leaders. Um, it's how I, I actually, grew up at the Gap for 11 years when I was first starting my career. So it's great to be back you know, at a Gap Inc. brand again. Um, but I learned it along the way. We're very self-taught and we have this kind of entrepreneurial spirit. And we want to be able to share that knowledge with each other and grow everyone around us. And you see that I mean, retail pride in, it, in its terminology is so interesting when you look at photographs on LinkedIn to me, because there's a lot of conversation a lot of celebration around people being promoted great store visits back rooms you know that's all retail pride um and it's kind of if your career is accidental then teach someone else and bring someone else along the way i like that and that that without that degree in place your network and the history that you built that is your degree that's the resume that you bring to the table I love exactly it. exactly um, this one can be a little controversial, but I'll explain it. The love of the million dollar hustle, because when you think again, you're running a multi-million dollar business, but if you're a store manager in a, in a $2 million store in, in a mall, you know, your goal is then I want to get to the $5 million store. I want to get to the flagship. That was always my goal when I was an assistant manager and a store manager. I want to be a general manager of a flagship. I wanted to run a flagship. Uh, and th so there's this drive around the million dollar hustle and these benchmarks um, to to get there. Um, you know, I'm lucky enough to run you know a large team of million dollar sellers. But those million dollar sellers 
want to then sell $2 million the next year. There's this, this I love to just call it like the million dollar hustle because that's a, it's a way that, that people become motivated and inspired and, and drive their, their kind of own, their own sense of accomplishment forward. Um, but this, this rings true for a lot of people. Absolutely. Um, number nine, we create friendships that can last decades. I can't even tell you how many people that I have worked with in the past 30 years who I'm still friends with, who are quoted in my book, who are um, connected with regularly, who may or may not still work in retail, but we created friendships because you go through this experience of working side by side, running a multi-million dollar business, you know, in high traffic, high, um, high, high level, high touch, I should say, levels of business. And that creates a bond that um, can't be replaced. And I do believe very strongly, you're not only creating your own family, but you're creating these friendships that last for decades. Um, and we can all, you know, hope to be leaders who people aspire to follow and follow for, for years to come. Yeah. Um, and the last one, and again, for many of us, retail is an accidental career. Uh, I hear it, I, I could give you a percentage, 70, 80% of the time in, a, in an interview, when I ask someone to tell me their story, it, it, it is often an accident and that they ended up in this business because they worked in it in college, it was a part-time role, they didn't intend to ever run their own store, run their own company, you know, be a multi, multi-store leader. Um, it really was an accident, but they love it. And they love this idea of how they're doing it, and why they're doing it, um, and that that should be celebrated. And, the, and what happens sometimes if it's accidental is that you then, you don't own your own experience. You say, well, I'm gonna do this for a few more years then I'm gonna do something else. And I would say, actually, let admit to the fact that you love it and admit that you want to do this more and that own own your experience and then own your network and build people around you because that is how you know all of these stores that have closed this year getting your next role is really about your network and so if you admit that this is no longer accidental and i need to surround myself with incredible people in order to grow my career it's a surprisingly not always well done um, initiative by candidates. Um, and so know that it's accidental, but admit that you love it and move your career forward. Um, great, so you know, I think how I want to wrap this up was if you, I think e even after this year, what I'm trying to say is Take the advantage, take your own pride in this business and your own joy in this business and pay it forward and share it with other people. Because the first question I often get is, oh, working in retail must be really hard. It must be, um, you know, not, it's, there's an assumption that this is not a great career. And my counter is, this is absolutely a great career and the options are limitless and the brands and the roles and the opportunities that are presented in front of you are limitless. But no one ever tells you that. And when you're just starting out, they say, well, you'll do this for a while and you may not have worked for a great company or great boss, own your experience and pay it forward. Tell someone else how great this industry is. And I think the success of the book, you know, it's only been out nine weeks, um, has been because for the first time, someone said, it's okay to love retail. It's okay to work in stores. It's okay to love what you do and to, to be as proud as you can, as, as you want to be of this business and this industry. Um, and so I, I have thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to just put some smiles on people's faces through, the, through this book and through this industry. Absolutely. I would be one of those people for sure and i think it speaks to number three that when you were talking about sharing the knowledge we're building 
not only a new store experience, but we're really building the next generation of consumers and the next generation of retailers. And I think this message of retail pride is something that was very timely for sure for right now. Mm -hmm. And we definitely appreciate you coming on today, Ron. Uh, I had a feeling that we would go over time and we did, but if it's okay with the panel, uh, we do have a good number of people here. If we can address a couple of the questions that we're seeing come in. The first one, I think uh, this would definitely be for you, Stacey. You mentioned dealing with five different landlords and one of our audience members was asking, how are you able to get out of your leases? Uh, they're in Texas and they're saying in Texas, it is impossible. Well, I think New York and probably California are impossible too. And what I have to say, number one, is I went directly to the landlords. I didn't want to, and that was not my comfortable spot, but I went directly to them and I had a really honest conversation with them. And we did use some of our PPP money to um, negotiate with our landlords. And I also want to be really upfront and say I had personal guarantees on every single one of those, and we negotiated out. It, you know, I, I didn't have a choice, and I went to them, and I was honest, and I was consistent, and if they didn't get back to me, I called them the next day, and it was not an email conversation. It was me in their office knocking on their door saying, look, this is not going to go well. And like I said, that didn't feel comfortable to me, and it was my last resort, but it was also the only way that I was going to emerge on the other side with my business. Again, I think it speaks uh, back to the courage, just the courage to take the reins and do what's best for your business. It was really next... hard. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even imagine. Uh, this next question here, um, a long one, I think this one is for Brian. Uh, Craig is asking, so even with the vaccine coming over the next six months, many companies are rethinking at work, work at home policies. So many people are going to remain home over the next year versus in office. And how do you expect that to impact the casual leisure lines versus traditional apparel? Yeah, I don't think uh, it's mutually exclusive. I don't think a return to polished dressing or a reconsideration of polished dressing necessarily means that people will be throwing their sweatpants uh, in the back of their closets or discarding them entirely. Uh, you know, I, I do think that activewear and athleisure looks will continue. Um, I think the opportunity here for a retailer uh, is interesting merchandising, um, high, low opportunities, mixing and matching, uh, having that point of view that both Stacy and Ron touched upon really showcasing uh, what makes your vision, your merchandising so special, right? So if you could do something that your competition is not, um, that just gives you an advantage. So kind of have fun with that idea of seeing how uh, you can incorporate some of those more comfortable looks uh, with some more polished looks. Excellent. Paul, I think this is one definitely for you in your presentation. You mentioned limiting selection. How do, I'll just read it verbatim here. How do I go about limiting my selection when I'm already sitting on this inventory that's been here since March? Oh, you're on mute, Paul. We're talking about limiting selections going forward. And one of the best ways is actually an exercise that I uh, strongly recommend to retailers if they want to rethink the product mix and um, the focus going forward. And that is walk outside your store, turn around three times, 360 degrees, click your heels twice, and, and say there's no place like home. Then I want you to open your eyes and pretend that the store is empty. In other words, you're looking at four blank walls. And if you were to open the store again, knowing what you know today, knowing what you've gone through the last 10 months and knowing where you believe the business is going to be going for the next year to two years, what would you change? Would the store look exactly as it does now? Or would there be things that you would do differently if you had the opportunity to do it all over again? And once you know that, once you know how you would change, that's your plan of action in terms of, of, of streamlining the inventory that you're carrying and who the customer is you want to sell. Excellent. 
Well, I want to thank everybody. Most importantly, our panelists here. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, this will be our final webinar here in 2020. But if we've learned anything from this year, it's that the retail community, I think to Ron's point during his presentation, the retail community is thirsty for knowledge. And here at Management One, we are going to make a concerted effort to reach back out to the community with educational sessions like this in the weeks, months, and years to come. Uh, so if you have any additional ideas that you wanted to throw out to us, anything that you want us to present on, always feel free to reach out and give us some ideas. Uh, we've put together about two dozen webinars just dedicated to the COVID-19 pandemic, and all of them, including this particular one, are up on our YouTube channel available totally for free at your disposal. We definitely encourage you to share them with your team. And I think the message that I'll probably leave with is, as I'm showing on the screen, just thank you. Thank you to the retail community for enduring this year and showing you resilience and showing how adaptable you can be. I think it makes me excited and I know some of the, the folks that work here at Management One our panelists included, it really makes me excited for what is to come in 2021 and beyond. And we all looking forward, we're looking forward to sharing it with you. I want to wish everybody uh, happy holidays and best wishes in the new year. Thank you again to Ron Thurston. Uh, thank you to Brian Trunzo, Stacey Pecor, and our panelists here at Management One. We look forward to reaching out to you guys in the new year. Thanks again. Thank you.